Hi, this is Bob Meyer, and this is the first of two mini-lectures on how to design and analyze conjoint choice experiments. In this, in this first mini-lecture, I'm going to be talking about how to design the survey instrument that you would be giving to respondents in your conjoint study. In the second mini-lecture, I'm going to be talking about how to analyze the data after you've gathered it. The goal of a conjoint study is pretty straightforward. The objective is to design a survey instrument in which we're going to be asking people to make a series of choices among sets, often pairs, of hypothetical alternatives. For example, uh, pairs of new brands which might be appearing on the marketplace that vary in different attributes, or possible potential new services. It turns out that Jump offers an easy-to-use tool for the optimal design of the choice sets, or what are going to be the pairs or triples of options that you're going to be presenting to people and having them evaluate. Now the design problem that Jump uh, tries to solve is the following. Uh, what we want to do in designing this instrument is two things at once. One of which is we want to create as many profiles as we need or choice sets as we need to ensure that there is independent variation on all the attributes. The idea is that eventually we're going to be building a regression model where our dependent variable is choice or preference for options, and our independent variable are going to be the attributes of those options. So ideally, we'd like to have a lot of independent variation on the, uh, on the attributes. At the same time, we also want to minimize the number of choices that we ask people to make. The idea is that if we give them too many choices, then they'll become fatigued, not complete the survey, and so on, and that's going to hurt the quality of our statistical inferences. The problem is, is that these are typically conflicting goals. To give you an example, the easiest and best way to have an independent variation in an experiment is to construct a full factorial design, that is, have people judge all possible combinations of attributes and levels. So for example, uh, imagine we had a study in which we had two different factors and we wanted it to be varied at three levels each, let's say price at three levels and quality at three levels. Well, that's going to give us nine possible combinations. Well, that's a reasonable thing to ask a person to do, that is make nine judgments. The problem is, is it becomes completely infeasible as the number of attributes and levels grow. For example, suppose we wanted to expand that set of attributes from two up until eight. Well, at that, le at that point, we'd have three to the eight combinations, which require 6,561 combinations, which is clearly way too many to give to someone. So what we do is the solution for it is to use something called fractional designs. And fractional designs, which are going to be available to you in Jump, is we try to find the smallest number of profiles that would allow you to efficiently estimate the parameters of an assumed model. By efficient, I mean pro provide the, the best or most precise estimates of parameters. For any given problem, Jump's going to offer you a range of design options that will allow you to make your own trade-offs between the survey length and model precision. So let's get started. Uh, the best way of getting going is to go ahead and open Jump, and if you could do that in a separate window, that would be great. Otherwise, just follow along here. So what's going to happen is when you open up Jump, you're going to see a menu of options at the very top, and the one that we're going to be spending most of our time with uh, is the DOE option, okay, up in the upper left. Now if you go ahead and you click on that, all of a sudden you'll see a drop-down menu that's going to show you a range of different possibilities of ways in which you might want to approach designing an experiment. Now the two that we're going to be interested in are custom designs and choice designs. Custom, choice designs is something new that was, been, that was added in the past few years to Jump and is specifically designed for people who are interested in designing conjoint choice experiments uh, with marketing or other applications. Now the interfaces of both custom designs and choice designs are quite similar. For example, if we were to click on choice design, we're immediately going to see a menu that looks like this. And if you notice, one of the things down there, and we'll, give you, we'll be giving you an illustration of this in a minute, is you can add different factors and levels. And for custom designs, it's going to look very much the same. Now, uh, in custom designs, there's a couple of other options, and we'll talk about those at the very end. 
To illustrate the approach, let's suppose we wanted to design a study where we're interested in how consumers made choices among hypothetical products that varied in four different attributes, brand name, price, design, and warranty. We wanted to vary brand name at four different levels, alpha, beta, gamma, or sigma. Uh, we wanted to vary price at three different levels, 40, 60, or 80, design at two levels, plain or elaborate, or warranty at two levels, one year or lifetime. Now the way we'd proceed is pretty simple. We'd pull open the Design of Experiments module and jump, uh, click on Choice Design, and the first thing you would see is the menu below. And what you'd want to click on is Add Factor, and then you would sequentially simply add the number of factors that you want to include in the design. So when you click on Add Factor, it's first going to ask you how many levels you want that factor to have. So if our first factor was going to be brand name, we'd want to click on four levels for brand name. And immediately that factor is going to be listed on the template with a generic name X1. And of course, what we, what we would want to do next then would be to simply relabel it such mm -hmm. that the factor now instead of being called X1 would be called brand. The attribute levels rather than L1, L2, and so forth are going to be our brand names, uh, in particular alpha, beta, gamma, and sigma. After we have done that, then we'd want to repeat the process for the other factors in our design. Uh, so as you see below here, I've gone ahead and I've entered in all four of the attributes and given them their correct labels. So we're almost there. We're two steps away. Uh, then in order to continue, we'd uh, see that continue button down there. What you'll next be taken to is a design interface like the one here. Now the first thing that's going to happen when you look at this thing is you're going to be fairly intimidated by this very uh, kind of complex looking uh, series of uh, tables and matrices on saying prior means and prior variances. Um, what these basically are for is uh, for advanced applications. It sometimes helps if you can have some prior idea about the relative effectiveness of different attributes, for example, on choice. But I think for most applications, we can just go ahead and ignore that because we're, chances are we're not going to have that prior information. So just go ahead and not worry about it and leave it at its default values. Now, the, the thing that we do want to focus in on, that where we're going to have to make a couple decisions, is when, below where it says design generation. Within the design menu, there are two primary numbers that we have to make a decision about, one of which is the number of profiles per choice set or the number of options we're going to give people. Uh, the default is two, and I would suggest always leaving it at two. This means uh, binary choice, which are fairly simple choices for people to make. Uh, in principle, we could make that be a larger number, but that tends to make the, cho the choice problems too complicated for people. The other option, which is one we do have to pay a lot of attention to and, and often we will be varying, is the number of choice sets per survey uh, or the number of choices we're going to be giving people. The rule is this. The minimum number of choice sets per survey we can specify has to be at least as large as the number of degrees of freedom of the models that we're going to be estimating. And in particular, there's a very simple rule for figuring this out. It's 1 plus the total number of attribute levels that we have in our experiment minus the number of attributes. So for example, in our experiment, we had four different attributes. The first one was at four levels, one at three, one at two, and another at two, or 11 levels total. So therefore, we have 11 minus 4 plus 1, or 8, is the smallest number of choice sets per survey. We could have more choice sets, but that's the minimum number that we can specify. Now in our particular case, the, the minimum number of choice sets that we can give people is eight, and that is indeed, as you see below, is the, 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 the default number of choice sets listed. This will not always be the case, and it's really important when you're designing this to make sure that the number of choice sets per survey is greater than the degrees of freedom, uh, as we indicated before. So what happens after that is we simply go ahead and click on Make Design, and voila, we're all done. Uh, there you see in the uh, highlighted box are the different choice sets. So what you see is choice sets 1 through 8. Um, and so, for example, the first choice set would give people a choice between a, a brand a, a Sigma with a price of 80, elaborate design, and a lifetime warranty, versus the second option, which is Alpha, also at a price of 80, a plain design, and a one-year uh, uh, warranty. 
So the idea would be in your study, you would be giving people eight different choice sets, and the uh, layout there tells you what the composition of those choice sets should be. Okay. Questions that come up. Uh, one of which is you might ask, well, should I always use the minimum number of choice sets, that is one plus the number of degrees of freedom? Uh, and the answer is, well, it's kind of yes and no. Generally speaking, the number more choice sets you can ask people to evaluate, the higher the statistical precision. So for example, if you thought that it was the case that in that study people could reasonably respond to maybe 12 or 13 scenarios, you might want to increase the number of choice sets. The problem is there's no hard rule on the maximum number of choices you can ask people to make. It depends a lot on how complicated each choice set is. So for example, if there are eight or nine different attributes, um, making choices between a single pair of options can be really difficult. Uh, on the other hand, if there's only two or three attributes, or maybe four attributes, like in the study we just illustrated, it's reasonable to ask people to make a, a larger number. Um, and in a lot of applied work, 20 sets are not uncommon. Um, a couple of other things to think about is uh, imagine if you have too many factors or worry that your respondents are not going to be, uh, be able to make more than a small number of choices, what you should do. Well, one thing you can do is to simply break up the survey and give uh, different subsets of the, of the respondent pool different groups of, of, of random options. Now in Jump you can do this automatically by varying the number of surveys and in the design generation menu uh, there's a little box where you can click on number of surveys. The default is one. That means that each respondent is going to get all of the profiles from the design. Now on the other hand if let's say the minimum number of uh, choice sets you, that you have to give is let's say 30 and you think that's excessive for any one person to make, what you might want to do is, is enter there two for two different surveys and what's going to do is randomly generate two subsets which you would then analyze by pooling them all together when you're done. Okay, one question which often comes up is, what if it's a case where you're in a context where it doesn't make sense to give people choice sets? Um, that is, for example, if it's a brand new to the world product and it's not logical that they would choose one option versus others. Um, or alternatively, you wanted a study where you just simply wanted to have people rate on a rating scale the likelihood that they would choose individual options. Well, in those sorts of cases, you can't use uh, the choice set designs, but rather you have to use uh, custom designs from the DOE menu. And basically, It's going to look exactly like uh, the choice set design, and you proceed with exactly the same matter. And in particular, you would click on factors, and you would enter them just like you did in the choice set design. And the menu format is a little bit different. Uh, then in particular, um, you, the one thing you would want to indicate when constructing the design is that you want the factors to be categorical, and that's an option that they give you. Uh, and the other thing is, is that rather than calling it the number of choice sets or the number of, uh, of sets to give people, uh, they're going to call these numbers of runs, and those are just simply the number of profiles to give. Um, what they'll do is they, they'll, they'll think ahead and they'll give you a default, which represents sort of their notion of the best compromise between highest statistical efficiency and smallest number of combinations to give to people. Um, my recommendation, my strong recommendation, would always be to choose the default. Uh, so in particular, in that case, I accepted the default, ran the design, and, and here are the 12 different combinations that I would give to people, or 12 different product profiles. So how would you give these in a survey? Well, you might have 12 different questions in which you would ask them to evaluate their overall attractiveness of each of these different options. Or maybe another one would be a, a choice experiment where you would simply say, uh, where you would ask a person to say whether or not they would find this option to be acceptable or not. Okay, a couple of final design trip tips. One of which is whenever possible, try to economize on the levels of factors rather than the number of factors themselves. Uh, for statistical reasons, it turns out that you can get greater efficiency when estimating models on smaller numbers of levels rather than larger numbers of levels, whereas it's easier to add factors than levels. So for example, for price, you should never need more than three levels because that's going to allow you to estimate a concave price function or a point of diminishing uh, sensitivity, which is usually the thing that you're most interested in.
Now, usually where it's hard to cut down numbers of levels is when you have qualitative factors, like you're interested in um, the effect of different uh, places of manufacture or different brand names or different colors. Well, in that case, is one way in which you can get some efficiency is by grouping them into categories. Like, for example, suppose that the levels of location are New York, Boston, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, and you really think that the main difference in people's minds is not going to be the cities themselves, but the region of the country. Well, in that case, rather than having four levels, you might consider just two levels, northeast and west coast. Okay, some vital tips and words on implementation. Usually when applying the studies, what, what you would do is you would take all the different scenarios and you would administer them pe to people through your favorite web-based survey tool, such as Qualtrics. Uh, in a typical application, you give people a series of choices between the experimental pair and a neither or a no choice option. The reason why the neither or no choice option is usually there, and this is typically very important, is we want to make sure when we analyze the, the data that we're pe measuring people's absolute preferences for attributes, not just relative. The other thing is the question always comes up as to how many respondents do you need? Well, there's no hard and fast rule on that, but I should say in a typical industry application, you're going to have sample sizes of about 400. But one of the nice features about the design is given that in principle, you could estimate a choice model for each person in the, in the study, you could get a reliable statistical estimate with much smaller samples, for example, as small as 30. Of course, the degree to which you can generalize from that small sample is going to be a, a different question. But statistically, you can certainly estimate the models. That's the end of the first module. And the second module, we're going to be talking about how do you analyze the data when you finally get it back.